Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Total Organic Chemistry. This time, we're taking a look at the nucleophilic addition to carbonyl compounds. By the end of this video, the questions that you should be able to answer are how do nucleophiles react with carbonyl compounds, how do I form an acetal, and how do acetals react, and how don't they react. If the carbonyl group is a new functional group to you, I would encourage you to visit the video at the top of the screen to get an introduction to how these compounds can be synthesized in some of the most basic ways before continuing on with this video. Okay, let's get right into it. Let's start by considering one of the most basic carbonyl compounds, and this is acetone, commonly sold as nail polish remover. We see that we have this carbon-oxygen double bond, and some of the most important reactivity of carbonyl compounds comes from this double bond. You'll see that we can draw a resonance structure, where we take two of the electrons in the double bond and move them up to the oxygen, giving us a negative formal charge on the oxygen and a positive formal charge on the carbon. This tells us that the carbonyl oxygen is Lewis basic, which means it can often be protonated or form an adduct with a Lewis acid, whereas the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic. In this resonance structure, it has an incomplete octet and a positive formal charge, which means it is susceptible to attack by nucleophiles. One example of this that we've already discussed is the Grignard reaction. If we take acetone as our carbonyl starting material and treat it with a Grignard reagent such as methyl magnesium bromide, we often do this in diethyl ether as a solvent. We know that the carbon atom in the Grignard reagent acts as a strong nucleophile, so this bond between carbon and magnesium can swing up to attack the electrophilic carbon atom of the carbonyl, and the pair of electrons in the carbon-oxygen double bond come up to the oxygen. This gives us the intermediate, where the methyl group is now attached to that carbonyl carbon, and we have the oxygen with a formal negative charge. Then, upon our aqueous acidic workup, we can protonate the oxygen atom on the intermediate, giving us the final alcohol product. This mechanism is what we would call an anionic mechanism, where the oxygen atom in the intermediate has a formal negative charge. It is deprotonated. This is common in strongly basic conditions or with strongly basic nucleophiles like Grignard reagents. However, many of the reactions of carbonyl compounds occur with weaker nucleophiles under neutral or acidic conditions. We can imagine taking our acetone starting material and treating with some aqueous acid. This will lead to the formation of some amount of what we call the hydrate or a geminal diol because we have two alcohol groups on the same carbon atom. You'll notice I've drawn equilibrium arrows here to denote that the reaction is reversible. Additionally, although there will always be some amount of the hydrate around an aqueous solution, they're usually not stable enough to be isolable. If we look at the mechanism for this reaction, we can start by remembering that the carbonyl oxygen is Lewis basic, so it can be protonated by our H3O plus that is around in solution. This gives us an important intermediate called an oxocarbenium ion, and because that oxygen has a positive formal charge, it's essentially an activated carbonyl, as it makes the carbon atom of the carbonyl more electrophilic. Our only nucleophile around is water, so we can have a molecule of water come and attack that carbon atom swinging the electrons in the carbon-oxygen pi bond up to the oxygen to give us this intermediate, where we have now formed the carbon-oxygen bond and where this oxygen has a positive formal charge. Then we can regenerate H3O plus by deprotonating that oxygen, which leads us to the final hydrate product. If we take a small step up in complexity, we can again take our model starting material, acetone, and I've been using acetone for all of these reactions as the simplest ketone, 
but these reactions can also be performed with aldehydes, where the carbonyl group is on the terminal carbon of a chain. If we treat this instead of water with an alcohol, I'll just use ROH, as well as some catalytic H+, some acid in solution. The mechanism is the same as before with the hydrate, but now that we have an alcohol instead of water, we will form this species called a hemiacetal, where we have an OH and an OR group on the same carbon. Now these hemiacetals are usually not isolable, much like hydrates. However, if we treat with additional alcohol, these are also in equilibrium with the acetal. This is where we now have two OR groups on the same carbon. And acetals are often stable enough to be isolated, which makes them useful in many situations. Let's take a look at one of those. Let's imagine this ketone with an iodide on the beta carbon over here. Let's say we'd like to treat this with an alkynyl lithium reagent we've just prepared. And we'd like to add the alkynyl group onto the carbon bearing the iodide. We want to perform sort of an SN2-like reaction here. However, we know that these organolithium reagents really like to add to carbonyl compounds, just like Grignard reagents. We will likely end up getting this compound, where the alkynyl group is bonded to the same carbon of the carbonyl. Okay, so how can we stop the carbonyl group from reacting? What we can do instead is first treat the starting material with an alcohol. A very common alcohol for this use is ethylene glycol. This is actually a diol, so we have two alcohol groups. And if we add in some catalytic H+, we can form an acetal. Because our alcohol actually has two OH groups, this will form a cyclic acetal. Then we can go ahead and treat with our alkynyl lithium reagent, and now the acetal carbon is no longer electrophilic, like the carbonyl carbon. Therefore, we only have one electrophilic site in the molecule, and we will get a pretty clean SN2-like reaction, adding that alkynyl group onto the carbon bearing the iodine. Then we can take advantage of the reversibility of acetal formation, treating this with aqueous acid to regenerate the ketone. This shows us that cyclic acetals are very useful as protecting groups for ketones or aldehydes in organic synthesis. Not only are cyclic acetals useful in organic synthesis, they are also prevalent in everyday life. If I draw this compound, where we have this carbon backbone and several hydroxyl groups dangling off of it, and then this ends in an aldehyde, this is actually glucose, which is a simple sugar molecule. We'll notice that that aldehyde is a carbonyl functional group, and we also have this alcohol nearby, which is a good nucleophile. So if we treat this with some aqueous acid, I'll just write that as H+, we can form an acetal. And if you'll notice, this is actually a hemiacetal, where we have an alcohol group and an OH bonded to the same carbon. I said earlier that hemiacetals are usually not stable enough to be isolable. However, if you examine glucose in solution or in the human body, you'll find that over 99% of it exists in this cyclic hemiacetal form. And this shows us how powerful cyclic acetals can be. They are more stable than acyclic acetals because they are entropically favored. What this means is that with an acyclic acetal, we need to start with one molecule of carbonyl compound and two equivalents of alcohol, but with a cyclic acetal, we only need one alcohol molecule. And this means that the change in entropy of the cyclic acetal formation is more favorable than with the acyclic case. To finish up this video, let's consider one other type of acetal. One more time, I'll use acetone as our starting ketone material. And instead of treating this with a diol, we can use a dithiol, which is the sulfur equivalent of an alcohol. Instead of using an aqueous protic acid to catalyze this reaction, we'll use a Lewis acid like zinc chloride. And we might do this in an organic solvent like diethyl ether. This forms a cyclic thioacetal, 
where we have these two sulfur atoms bonded to the same carbon. And the mechanism for this reaction is the same as we've discussed before. The nice thing about thioacetals is that they are resistant to hydrolysis in aqueous acid. Like I mentioned earlier, if you treat an acetal with an excess of water and some acid to catalyze the reaction, it will reform the carbonyl compound. In order to hydrolyze the thioacetal back to the starting material, we need to use a mercury-2 salt, such as mercury-2 chloride. And this is often done in a solvent like acetonitrile. So, for example, if we have some more complex molecule where we want to protect a carbonyl group and then perform an acid-catalyzed hydrolysis on some other functional group in the molecule, a thioacetal might be a good way to protect that carbonyl because the thioacetal is resistant to hydrolysis. Another interesting property of thioacetals is that they can be catalytically hydrogenated. These are similar conditions to what we've seen before, using hydrogen gas and rainy nickel as a catalyst. This actually hydrogenates the acetal carbon, giving us the base hydrocarbon chain as a product. This is a process called desulfurization, and it is one way to take a carbonyl compound and simply remove the carbonyl group in two steps, reducing the starting material down to the hydrocarbon. I hope this video gave you a good introduction to the reactivity of carbonyl compounds and how to form and use acetals in organic synthesis. If this video helped you, please go ahead and like and subscribe to the channel. If you are willing and able, please consider donating to my Patreon page, which helps me continue creating all of this content for all of you. Thanks for watching.